coming to the speakers of today tonight uh, we have joy uh, joy is the vp of product and community at sequoia capital india uh, from the heart she is a product builder she has done two major key pilots at sequoia in sprout and search both of these you should be aware of uh, she will be driving uh, earlier she has also worked with uh, 24 7.ai and she'll be driving the chat with jeff today uh, we have also have jeff jeff as famously known as gmj on twitter and jeff is a managing partner at chapter 1 uh, chapter 1 is like a product team on your vc table so do check it out uh, jeff as you know has previously previously run product teams at tinder majorly focusing on revenue and monetization uh we'll be talking a lot about jeff so i'll keep the intros light and yeah with this uh just one two quick things you can drop some questions in the q and a section and upload those questions as well uh joy basis time will take up those questions and drive the conversation accordingly and yeah with this i hand it over to joy and yeah thank you so much guys the two of you did for joining us and hosting us and yeah take over to joy Yep thanks Parth and thank you Jeff for joining us today so excited to have you here um here's i think how we'll run this we'd love to learn more about how you built tinder into the number one top grossing app on the app store your views and ethos on product just building shipping you know sticky highly engaged products um building high performance teams and of course angel investing to now a vc at chapter 1 Um so let's begin at the beginning tell us your product story you grew up in the bay area and then you went down to UCLA and then to film school how did you transition into product yeah it was really um a random story which i actually find a lot of product people have a uh, very different backgrounds it's very hard to there's no formula for getting in the product right um and so for me i just always really love to build things from an early age i was um you know i had a store on ebay growing up where i was selling sports cards i had um a music blog in college where i was curating music for my friends and so i was always just kind of <clears throat> tinkering with things on the internet and then leaving i guess the year was like 2006 when i graduated and a lot of, a lot a lot of the social internet had not been built yet um God, I realize I sound really old as I'm saying this, but uh, <laughs> it was um, like Facebook was just kind of coming out, and uh, you know I, I was becoming more obsessed with with the internet, and went to um, film school. Quickly realized that film as an industry just wasn't growing as much as as the technology industry. And um, <clears throat> the personal story is I was living in Los Angeles. Um, my girlfriend and i broke up and i was like i was like i am going to go drive to san francisco and start working in tech this is like the perfect um reason to go do this and um you know we can get more into like the career path but i didn't have i didn't have a ton of access to to startups at the time and needed to to really fight my way into the industry it, i got rejected by so many companies so um my story is not like i didn't go to google and do the apm program at google um i needed to to be a little bit more creative with my my career path and 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 you broke into tech via zardly and i i, I had a company called zardly yeah tell um, us a little bit about how did you land that gig and then from there to tinder yeah definitely so i went the i went to south by southwest in 2010 um and just was going to meet people and there was a company that just been been funded at um by like Ashton Kutcher and Michael Arrington and all these kind of fancy people but the idea really resonated with me which was um I was in San Francisco I was at, at a, a co-working space called Rocket Rocket Space and I had a desk right next to the Uber team which was eight people at the time and oh, wow. um it was really interesting and and you know i was a little bit um i applied to uber at the time to get a job there just to be like one of their first kind of like swiss army knife type of employees didn't 
didn't get a response from Travis or Ryan, Ryan Graves, um, even though I worked like right next to them, it was a little bit awkward. Uh, <laughs> and there was this company at South by doing, um, it was basically like Uber for everything. You could, you, you can use your phone to make a request and people around you can do that for you. Uh, and, and I, I got the job offer, but the, they said I had to move to Kansas city, which I don't know, um, how well, uh, any, any of, you know, like Kansas city, it's a really boring place. Um, not somewhere where you'd want to, to move if you were living in San Francisco to start your tech career. But, um, within 24 hours, I moved to Kansas city and, um, found myself working on, it was, it was more growth marketing than product because we were doing more, it was like building landing pages and very, um, very funnel focus in terms of what, what I was doing. It was not core product. Um, but through the, if any of you have built landing pages for a long period of time in your career, you actually become really good at product because you, you, you start to think in terms of funnels and, um, so much of how I view products is just the end to end customer journey. And when you're, it's a really good place to start in product is the top of the funnel and just driving demand and knowing what people, what value propositions resonate with people through testing CTAs, um, where you place, you know, copy, uh, all the images you use. So I, I kind of think of, um, if you think of, of, of landing pages as like movie posters is how I kind of think about it. Like what, what is like that hero image and what are the words and titles that, that will get people to, to just stop and, and sign up for your product. And, um, so yeah, that was a kind of a long story, but, uh, but that's kind of how I got here. <laughs> that's awesome. So how did that, and then from Zarli into Tinder, what was that journey like? And then how did you get into Tinder? And I'm very curious and I'm sure most of us in the room are like you drove revenue products. That is so rare. So tell, tell us a little bit about that and then we'll dive deeper into revenue products. Yeah, definitely. So, um, so I guess the product I left, I left Zarli, I was still like a growth marketer. I was not a great, I wasn't thought of as being a product person. And then probably a lot of you use, um, product hunt, but I, when product hunt came out, I was, I just was like, Hey, this is the best place to, to test different ideas. And I, I ended up releasing three products on product hunt that, that were number one within like three months. And so I was starting to get just a lot of interest for, for product jobs. And, um, T when Tinder called me, it was actually, I had just applied to YC and, and had gotten rejected from YC. And so I was, I gave up on, um, an idea I was working on and, and went to Tinder. But the, when I, when I arrived at Tinder, we had product market fit, but we had, we had very little revenue. And if you, if you join a product team, there, there are a couple areas where you can kind of like take ownership that really matter. And I knew, I knew if I just came in and said, Hey, I want to focus on revenue. You can really quickly become an important person within a company. If you're driving revenue, it's pretty obvious, but I think a lot of PMs, um, do not think to like walk into the office and say, I want to own, own revenue, especially at a consumer product. And so, um, you know, the transition from ad based business models to subscription models was starting to happen. And, uh, I knew if I could, could do a, a good job, you know, I would, I would, I would have a job for a long time. Um, so a little bit, a little bit of it was like, Hey, I want to make myself indispensable, which, um, ended up, ended up being a good decision for me. So I'm curious. Um, so you actually had a focus on revenue and monetization so early at um, at Tinder. And, we we uh, did, and yeah, I think ahead. part of that was, um, you know, dating as a category had a lot of historical precedents for building a subscription business, and so our, our big internal debate was. Um, a lot of our founders didn't want to, or some of our founders didn't um, want to do a subscription model. They were, they were more focused on, on other revenue streams. And um, we were getting a lot of pressure to monetize at the time. So 
we, we've moved pretty slowly into subscriptions, but, um, you know, I think there are some categories that are just easier to monetize because they're higher value than other and dating. When you think of like the hierarchy of needs, um, love and, and companionship is pretty high on that list. And so we knew, we knew people would pay for Tinder. We just didn't know exactly what the right mix of products would be. And, um, and we also didn't, it took us a while to, to get to kind of what became our most valuable feature, um, which was, was Tinder gold and, and being able to see who likes you, we thought was the best feature of it. Um, yeah, it was an incredible journey. I, I can also talk, uh, we actually had a very tough time monetizing in India. And so mm. that was a personal lesson. Um, there were, there were a lot of things that were, were challenging in India, but, um, but monetization was definitely one of them. Let's click on that a little bit, right? So when you went into Tinder and I think Match and the others, I'm sorry, OkCupid and the others were already doing monetization like it were a paywall. And here you had um, monetization almost tied into the engagement flow. Um, how did you folks come up with that? And, and you know, you give users almost superpowers, right? With Tinder Gold and Tinder Boost. Yeah, walk us through that, that journey of building out those features and, and integrating it so deeply. Yeah, I mean, a lot of it was responding to things that were happening on the platform. So like um, we had a feature where we limit the number of right swipes you can you can make per day. And that was candidly because um, users would come on the platform and right swipe on everybody um, to see to see who, who they'd match with. Um, and so it kind of took away from the intent of what um, you know, that action would be. And so there's a little bit of responding to behaviors. Um, I think some of the features we chose to monetize early weren't, they weren't really like high frequency activities. So one of them was called Passport, um, which lets you travel anywhere in the world to, to match with anybody. Um, people tended to use that more for traveling. And if you ever build traveling products, people don't travel every week or every day. So um, it wasn't a, a high frequency use case. And so a, lo a lot of what our journey was, was trying to get to, um, just trying to discover what what our highest value features were. And um, there was the feature I mentioned earlier, which was being able to see who likes you before you match, yeah. was pretty controversial internally because, um, you know, the biggest rule of rule set of Tinder that we created as PMs was um, not knowing who likes you till you match till you, you both swipe on each other, which we call the the double opt in. But mm -hmm. um, I guess the the lesson that's transferable to all product managers and and product thinkers is that we come up with this like every product you come up with a set of rules as a product team, right? It's like, here's how the, here's how we believe the product should function. Um, this is our philosophy and you have to be willing to break those rules and to constantly challenge your internal assumptions. I think we kind of get to the point with on some teams where we're like, that's how, like, that's just how the product is because someone before me, I didn't even know who they are, or why they made that decision came up with this rule set. Um, and you have to come into work every single day and challenge those rules really. And I found with monetization specifically, when we broke the rules of the product mm -hmm. and created, created value for, you know, smaller groups of subscribers, that's when we had breakthroughs as a, as a product team. Um, and so this is, this is really fun in social products, especially in, in, in gaming. Um, but I'm sure you can apply it to SaaS as well with different pricing models. Yep. Um, you know, I'm sure when, when you looked at Tinder and building out all of these things that you just spoke about, so many ideas, so many things you can do, because like you said, it's at the end of the day, it's just about bringing people together. So how did, how did the prioritization model work then? And yeah, how did you folks figure out what to roll and you know, maybe also tell us a little bit about how India was different in that sense? Because I know you tested out probably stuff in US and Australia, but then and then you have a contrasting market like India. 
Yes, that was the biggest challenge as a smaller product team was we had reached product market fit in basically the, the entire world. We were in um, uh, close to 300 countries and you're, I mentioned when I joined the team, there were only three people on the product team. So we were sitting there like, who, who do we build for at this point? And we knew in India specifically that there were, um, if you think about Tinder as being um, a two-sided marketplace, there was a, a huge imbalance between the number of men on the platform in India versus women. And um, we ended up hiring a local team. Um, we have a, a, a GM who runs India. And we did that actually like the day I started, I started with Taru, who um, is based in India and built a, a, a local team. But um, understanding the nuances of the market were was a huge challenge for us. And I think culturally from what we understood was that dating was still online dating was still um, not culturally accepted as as it would be in the US. It wasn't something that people talked about socially as much. And so um, and then on the topic of monetization, it was um, things as simple as our pricing wasn't localized to um, to the local economy. And so I'm sure we were I think we were overcharging in India for a long period of time. Um, and the price was too high. But um, again, like, and then you can get really nuanced with localization all the way down to, um, like our app store, the, 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 the people we featured on our, on our app store screenshots were clearly not local to India. They were, um, and so we needed to localize all of our app store assets. And then, um, on a product level, being able to think through what the local needs are in, in each country is a long journey. I think in like some countries really valued on Tinder specifically, safety and security was a big thing in different countries. Um, the Bra Brazil's market was, was one that comes to mind, but mm -hmm. you know, when you're building a product, our product team was based in Los Angeles and it's really hard to get that, that perspective. And then it's, it's even harder to prioritize it on your roadmap against new features you want to create that are, broadly applicable to the entire world. And so uh, I think this is probably why local competitors often win because their understanding of the market and the customers is just so much more nuanced. Um, and so, you know, what, I know there's local competitors to Tinder in India that maybe serve, they maybe serve the market in a more authentic way even. Um, and that's always something you were we were struggling to, to kind of keep up with. Got it. How does one prioritize then in that case, Jeff? Like you've got a product which is taking off in one market and you know you have an adjacency like an Indian market, which you know can grow. Um, how, how, would you, how would you prioritize then? I think the, um, like the business answer is we, we were a public company um, a, you know, two or three years into my Tinder experience and at some point in your local market, you just reach, you saturate your market in terms of, of, you know, your, your TAM and the, like we had already sat, saturated North America. We did surveys and we found out we literally had universe, like everybody we'd surveyed um, in the States, especially had heard of Tinder and had made their decision already as to whether they thought it was a product that, that they wanted to use. Um, so we had to go, we had to expand to other countries. We India was our um, fastest growing company from a signups um, in terms of signups, but we we still just weren't. I think it was like our number nine or ten um, ge geography in terms of monetization. So we we just we knew if we wanted to keep growing the revenue side of the business, we needed to uh, to grow internationally. And so India was one one country, but there were um, you know, LADAM was another example. Brazil was, was one of our fastest growing countries. Um, it was hard to monetize there, but yeah. And, and then you had mentioned Australia, which I think was interesting where a lot of U S, um, companies, AB tests in Australia, and it's, it's hard to get, and then they use those results and they start to, to release their products everywhere in the world. And I think it's because 
Australia is very similar to the US and you don't have to localize your product. And so it's a very simple A-B test to run. But, nice. You know, because the behavior in Australia might be very different from India. And then, you know, mm. if you're expanding to Japan or South Korea, like every region is so nuanced. It's just hard to, uh, it's really hard to prioritize these things unless you have just a ton of resources internally. Yeah, yeah, that that that's that's true. Um, just just to double click on, you know, you said you were a three member team that was building this out, and um, so how is that, you know, building out a revenue team say different from building out teams that are more focused on acquisition or engagement? Was there a difference there? Did you, yeah, there there is because there's often competing goals, um, which which was interesting, um, you know, like. For our business, if you created a new feature, you'd often take attention away from the places where we were monetizing most effectively. So um, a good example would be like, we released this thing two years ago, ago called Swipe Night, which was um, this multimedia kind of fully immersive 20 minute experience where you enter like a different world within Tinder and you're swiping um, the idea was like the world's ending and you're trying to find your perfect partner as the world's ending. But, um, for that experience, that's 20 minutes away from, from your core paywalls and where you're kind of driving most of your subscription revenue. And yeah. so, yeah, we had, we often had competing, I, I'd say competing goals. The one thing I was really proud of was I think we approached monetization when I was there from a, um, a product first mindset where we really cared about the users. And I think we all play the, the video games where you, every action you take, you see a new paywall and it's, you start to grind your users. And, um, yeah. the word, the word is that I kept on hearing is like, um, like you don't want to be too thirsty. That's, that's the word. <laughs> um, and, and we all, you can, all, you can always feel that within a product where, you, you almost feel like they're putting themselves first before you as as the cus as the customer, mm. <clears throat> and I, I always I always wanted our like when we ask you to subscribe, I, I at least wanted it to feel good. Um, and so like our our paywall animations at the time, our paywalls had animations. Um, oh. we spent a lot of time designing our paywalls to be to be very um, uh, I guess just user friendly. We didn't want we didn't want to grind our users and um, you know, I think, I think after, as the companies become more mature, um, every company becomes more mature and they start to ask more of their users in terms of uh, they're trying to monetize more and more. And it, it's, it's, I think that's when you become um, potentially, you can be disrupted because uh, like, if you think about Facebook as an example, when you see, the number of ads and the ad ad load, I think it's like one in every five tiles on, on your newsfeed is, is an ad. Um, Instagram, I think is one in every eight. So if, you know, you can imagine as, as they need more revenue, that number might increase over time. Yep. Yep. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, you, that, that brings me to this question about just, uh, you know, designing and building out social products, right? Which, and, you, and I think you mentioned this idea of just first principle product thinking as well. Um, so when you think of social products and their, you know, their journeys, which is so hard to predict, so hard to get right, um, is there a way to think about how do you build these out? And and how do you like solve for, for a user? Yeah, I think, um, well, our philosophy at Tinder, I can just tell you is, our motto is simple, fun, and useful. And so everything had to be very, very simple. And we um, debated every single screen to make it, you know, how can we make this just a little bit easier? How can we reduce one tap or um, one click? And so I kind of go crazy when I see um, products that aren't fully optimized and aren't simple because it's actually pretty easy to do and, and part of what we 
we're always, you know, like part of being great at product is, is reduction rather than addition. And so, um, constantly asking yourself, what can we remove to make this product more useful? And, um, we released something called Tinder social as an example, which it was swiping with your friends and it just wasn't doing, um, as well as we wanted to. And we removed it within six months. I think Twitter removing fleets was actually a really good example. Um, they, you have to act quickly when something's not working. I'm sure they probably ran a few iterations, but the hard, the hard part as a product team is admitting to yourselves when you, when you release something that you need to, to, to roll back. And, um, if you're a VP of product, it's especially hard because I feel like being a, being a VP of product or a, a product lead, um, you're, you're kind of always having to reprove yourself with every, every release. Um, and so reputationally, those can be hard moments in, at your, within your orgs, but you need to, part of being a good leader is admitting when you've made mistakes. And so, um, yeah, that's always been a big part of what, what we, what we try to do. Yeah. I mean, and, and I think the question there is right. Like how do you get these then back into your product roadmap? Um, and especially when they're experiments at, at scale. Um, yeah. How do you think of those in the short term versus say the long term? In terms of just getting, so you release something that doesn't do. Yeah, exactly. it doesn't do well. And, you know, how do you how do you build more experiments and and you know buy get more buy in for these? Yeah, I think um, it's. I think it's always reducing comes down to the actual building process too. It's not just removing, um, and so the quicker you can release an experiment, we. I'll give you like some real examples. Um, yeah. We released something at Tinder called Super Boost, which was we have this feature called Boost where you can boost your profile and more people see it. So you're basically giving your profile more impressions. But um, we had this idea. We're, we're like, what if we just release a boost that was like 10 times more powerful? And um, we talked to our engineers and they said, this this will take two months to build or whatever. It, it, was, it was going to take a long time to build. Um, and so we ran a, a, a smoke test where we just released a paywall within the app to a small subset of users and said, um, and they would click, it was to buy a super boost and they would click on it. And we tested two price points um, and our click through rate on the paywalls was, it made it so obvious that we needed to build that feature. Um, but we did that through, without engineers, we just released a, you know, basically a, a dummy paywall um, to to validate the idea, and uh, you know the the key is not upsetting your customers because um, if somebody wants to buy something they can't buy it, it's it's frustrating. But um, we took that chance for a small subset of users to inform our roadmap, and so I would say trying to reduce um, your experiments to like what is the core thing you're actually trying to test and um, mm. what's the simplest way we can validate that experiment? Cause I, I really think of everything we do as product people is just being a hypothesis and you run the experiment. And if you, you're trying to validate or invalidate those ideas um, as quickly as possible. Yeah. I think that that balance between what's cool, what's utility is it value adding, right? It's hard. The hardest part of this is getting your design team to to buy in because I think a lot, a lot, of, a lot of these things will not be pixel perfect. Um, and so you just have to build trust with your designers that you know how to run this efficiently and, um, and at some point you'll go back and build a proper experience. Yep. Um, which brings me to this this idea of, you know, like Tinder pioneered the swipe. Twitter had this pull to refresh. Um, is there a method to this madness of what may actually seem gimmicky, but is well-crafted game mechanics? And, and how does one build this muscle as a PM? Um, 
you know, especially when you have to work with product, you have to work with design, you have to work with engineering. So, so how do you build this? In in terms of just like the the everyday mechanics of this game. Yes. Yes. Um, you know, I'd say this: the best thing you can do is, I kind of think as product people as being, they're like collectors of ideas, and the way I've always, I've never tried to invent. Um, anything i i just use i obsessively use every product um and i don't keep every product on my phone but i i love to to tinker and the you know part of the craft of being great at product is being sort of like a, a historian for for different products that you've seen um and so when somebody has a feature idea i'm like you know i can really easily say like um, yeah, they did that well. Maybe it's a, like a referral system is a really easy um, uh, place to start. And so like when we built referrals at Tinder, I was like, you know, I want to do Robin Hood, um, but, but that was not the, it was a little bit too complicated. So then, then you go look at Uber and then you download yeah. Lyft and you're building just um, a canvas of, of inspiration that you can pull from. Um, and then you create your own version of it. So it's not, this isn't a, uh, this isn't a process of like cloning ideas, but you're just, you're always building, um, n you know, a new library of inspiration for yourself. And I think we all have like friends who, you know, like your friend who like knows every band, like they, they just know every song. Um, uh, it's kind of like being that friend for product where when you walk in the office, um, people know that you're, you're a student of the game and you um, you can tell within your teams who, who does that pretty quickly. Um, and I always wanted to be that person on our teams. That, that sounds like a super actionable way to actually hone your gut and intuition, right? And, and something that as PMs we need, which is balancing gut, intuition, and data. Um, how did you strike that balance? And you know, this might be a good time to ask that when you were a director of revenue at Tinder, you actually went on to do your MBA from UCLA. Um, yeah. So yeah, tell us a little bit about that. So I'm naturally, I think part of this is knowing, knowing who you are and being really self-aware with um, where you are on that spectrum of intuition versus data. Um, I'm admittedly way, more intuition based in how I approach products, at least early on at Tinder. Um, as the company grew and the stakes were, were much greater, we were a public company and we had, you know, board members and a huge, uh, a, just a huge um, amount of risk with every deci decision we made. I just had to be more data driven and um, part of, Part of doing that was I, I've been admitted to myself if I don't if I don't learn how to be more data driven, I'm just not going to be in this job very long. Like the job will outgrow me, and so I went. Um, I, I did my MBA on the weekends when I was at at Tinder, but the idea was just trying to trying to balance kind of balance my approach to product and. I never wanted to be the data driven PM because I think, um, I think you have to find a, ba a balance and the, the best product people I know tend to have both the right and left brain approach to, to building. Um, I tend to start with intuition and then use, try to use data to validate um, those ideas. But I know a lot of people who can run SQL qu queries for days and, um, and they, they let the, the data, um, guide them. It just, it just depends. I think on, on monetization specifically though, um, there's a lot within data that can just jump out at you. And, um, a lot of it has to do with, with your paywalls and, um, how different paywalls are converting. So, you know, within Tinder specifically, I think we had like, over 10 things that you could pay for um, and subscribe to. And so you can really easily look at data and say, hey, 
this is what's tr- driving the most value. Um, and, and then double down on that, um, on, on those value propositions, um, which was part of what we did with, with boost. Um, but yeah, I actually, I love this. I love this debate. Um, product versus or data versus intuition, I think is, this could be like an entire book. Um, and I'm sure all of you, um, have opinions on this too. So, <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and that's a, that's a good segue because I want to ask you about how do you test for this when you, when you look at hiring on your team, right? And now that you work with founders, how do you test for this, this whole intuition data and do you have a point of view on you know where one should lean whether when you're at an early stage versus a growth stage pm yeah it's a great great question i think um the more mature a company becomes um naturally i think the more data driven the product teams become because uh there's a lot of reasons but one is you just have the user base to to have enough data to make decisions (laughs) And so like Tinder day one didn't have any users. And so you need to use your, your intuition. The, um, you know, in terms of, of testing this during interviews, I think um, there are very, most PMs that we interviewed have, have built products before. And so you can really dive into the decision-making process for why people decided to, to make different choices at their past companies. Um, I also think people's backgrounds just make them, they're kind of like four sets of PMs that I think are really effective. One is um, just like the the generalist PM. And then I see a lot of great PMs who come from engineering um, or they come from design um, or they come from like the data science team. And so, um, you know, you, you, there's not like one filter I use, but I would say the best product teams I know have a really good balance between disciplines. And, um, you know, I kind of think of like, I don't know if, you know if you've ever seen like the movie Armageddon, but it's like they bring in 12 different, or like Ocean's Eleven, right? You bring in like 11 different people who have completely different backgrounds to solve a problem. And uh, you need you need to have a, a product team that has a lot of balance and um, it could be, it could be a discipline. It should also be um, in terms of, of people's life experiences. And so it should, you should have a diverse background from a gender perspective, from a socioeconomic perspective, um, like really making sure that you, you have different life experiences on your product team is, is really important. Yeah, I really like that, the diversity of experience and complementary skills, um, right? We, we, we absolutely could have done a better job of this early on at Tinder. I think um, a lot of our product team, um, at least initially, it was a lot, of, um, a lot of like men who grew up in California. I'm just like, and we should have um, hired more quickly to, to have just different perspectives. And we eventually did, but, um, that took us a little bit of time to do. And, uh, you know, I think you can be really intentional early on in your, when you're building a team to create that diversity from the start. So you have it, um, especially in a, a dating product, we absolutely, you need, you need many different, um, points of view and, and, but that applies, I think, to any social product and, um, and consumer product really. And, so, yeah, um, you know, which brings me to this question, right? What what does a high performance team look look like, Jeff? And I think everyone wants to be on one. Um, what does that look like, though? Yeah, I think to me, um, you're trying to build really self sufficient pods within your org, and so I kind of think of the best team as being um, you're trying to make every every team as flat as possible. So decision-making um, can happen really, really quickly. And so for, for Tinder specifically, like when we started to really perform well as a team was when we switched to the pod model. And so we had the revenue team, we had the growth team, um, we had pre-match, um, uh, we had discovery, we had post-match, but um, 
we were really trying to create specialists within the org that had just like a deep, um, like I was on the revenue team for four and a half years. And so by the time that's longer than I was in college and <laughs> this is all, this is all I was thinking about all day. And so, um, you know, I kind of think you, the more you can create leadership within your product team and, um, within different verticals, you'll just become a, a, a much, I think a, you, you can become world experts really. And I, I kind of felt like by the time I left Tinder, like I never expected to be like the subscription dating person, but I kind of felt like I was one of the best people in the industry. And I, when I came to Tinder, I, I knew nothing about monetization for dating. It just, you know, but, but somebody empowered me to, to go do that, which was really impactful. Yeah, I think two things stood out there. One was I think you you, you had bots, so therefore um, focused on user outcomes, and yeah. and and um, yeah, tell us a little bit about that, and also about rituals and practices that you may have had within these bots to just just hit it out of the park so much and so often. Yeah. Um, so we, yeah, I think when you're creating your pods, the key is being really clear with. Um, with your business goals and, and um, aligning the pods to match whatever those might be. Um, I see a lot of people create pods that are too specific, right? It's like um, you must like, like it's like the onboarding pod, right? And it's just like a team focus on onboarding, but that problem set isn't rich enough, I think to create a pod. So I, I would think of just, like your top three business goals and, uh, and create pods to go independently achieve those, uh, knowing there probably will be overlap between the groups and they have to work well together. Um, a lot of the rituals and each, each pod I think has its own culture really. And so within mm -hmm. the revenue team, um, I tried to, I started with, um, I think the most important relationship in any company is is the VP of product and the VP of engineering. Um, and like on the pod level, it's the, you know, the group, the, the lead PM and the engineering manager. And so when I, when I took over the revenue team, I tried to, to build just an amazing relationship with my EM. And so we, we would get, I like forced him to, to be my friend. I was like, we're gonna get dinner together. <laughs> Uh, and we're going to go like golf together. And, um, and we actually became really close friends, but the, that partnership set a good, um, foundation for our team, which was product and engineering are partners. We're actual, it's a real partnership. And, um, there was a lot of internal, there were things internally that, that I think had really upset engineers where, they had felt like at the time that they were being treated like service providers to product where um, like we were the, we were telling them what to, to build and we were getting the credit. And um, I really wanted to, to reset that within our team. And so, yeah, you need, you need a, you need a balance between the two. And, um, and then, you know, I think a big part of what we, what we tried to do is just, create pods within our pod. And so within, even within our pod, we had, we, we had ownership within the group. Um, and it, it feels very meta to say that, but you're basically trying to make everybody an owner of something. And, and that was how I think we, we started to really motivate people. Yeah. That, that's a super important point, right? Like I think we often end up seeing engineering as a downstream team, uh, you know, product gathers out the requirements and then kind of hand, hands it over. Um, so did you also do user interviews where you had engineering present? And uh, yeah, how did you do that? So how did you bring them onto the table? One was of course making friends, but, but you know, it, it's from a work <laughs> perspective. We, um, I think one of my biggest regrets probably at Tinder is we didn't do enough user interviews. And so um, we found it actually pretty, intimidating at our size to interview users ourselves. And we often we outsource that work to like UX researchers. And um, 
but we, I think we brought engineering into the design process pretty early. And so, um, you know, we do, we come up with a feature idea and, um, really quickly, I think we'd ask, I would ask my part engineering partner, um, Hey, I, like, what do you think of this? And, um, it wasn't like, Hey, how long will this take to build? Cause that's, again, that's like treating them like they're a contractor, um, or yeah. something. It was, it was, what do you think of this? Um, where do you, where do you see the risks? Where do you see this working? Um, and trying to make them feel, just feel like, again, appreciate and, and engineers are often, um, not like the loudest people to voice their opinions, but they definitely have opinions. And so I think your job is to, um, work with them to, to feel comfortable enough to, to participate in that, that part of the process. Um, and so we did that. The, 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 the risk here though, I think is that everybody's just ideating and nobody's doing <laughs> anything actual. <laughs> and, and so yeah. at the end of the day, I think it's, um, being clear, um, we value everybody's opinions, but just because you have an idea doesn't mean it will, it will be built. Um, but we do appreciate, um, uh, you know, we're open to every, every idea in the room. Yep. That's just such a great way to be inclusive, right? <laughs> it was, it was great. And then, you know, I think we did hackathons and, um, other, there were other moments where people could just build things. And I think that's super valuable to, to create in a, a great culture, just taking the how time. Often, to... How often did you do those? We did those, um, they were annual and then I think they became biannual cause it went really well. But, um, you know, I think it was probably like two weeks out of the year were dedicated to, um, to these open times where people could build, build things. Yeah, that's kind of awesome. Okay. I'm, I know we're almost at closing time, so I'm going to switch track. Um, Tinder to then chapter one. How did that happen? And tell us a little bit about chapter one and how did your journey in investing start? Yeah. Um, so while I was at Tinder, I was just investing a lot. So I was um, investing through AngelList. I was doing, I was a scout for Index Ventures. And I, um, as Tinder became bigger and more of a large company, I kind of found my escape through working with startups because I like the the part of startups I I like the most is pre product market fit. Like we don't know if this is if this is going to work, but um, but let's try and figure it out. And so yeah, I built Chapter One to be a product partner to founders who um, wanted help, whether it was tactical help, like hey will help you prioritize your roadmap to, I just want someone to call when like I have an idea and, and I don't have anyone else to, to, to kind of bounce this off yeah. of. And so, um, yeah, built chapter one in 2019. Um, the fund, um, well, I, we're now about to, to start deploying out of fund too, but it ended up being an early stage fund and we primarily work with, consumer businesses, but, um, but tend to do a lot of everything. We do a lot of crypto, FinTech, um, productivity tools. And so, um, and actually Sequoia invests in my fund. So, um, technically that makes us teammates in some. Yes. Way. <laughs> I was just thinking Taru was uh, an ex analyst at uh, Sequoia Capital India too. And, uh, and then she went <laughs> on to join. Uh, yeah. So it's a small world. <laughs> um yeah it's been it's been amazing i think the changes i'm seeing in venture capital i'm sure you see this on twitter there are just so many funds now um and so you have to have some really unique value proposition and um i think it's pretty cool that sequoia india has a vp of product uh like it kind of aligns with what um yeah. what i think chapter one might eventually become, which is 
more of a service provider with within product and design. Yeah, that would be, would love to see how that uh, journey evolves. Um, you know, question here is. Um, what are the problems you're solving now and what are you looking out for over the next, say, five to 10 years? Where, where do you see this? I remember a tweet, I think, from 2019 where you said, um, Ellie is probably going to be the center of consumer tech. And it's almost like you <laughs> to be true. Um, so what are you watching for now? Yeah, I've just been really um, personally intrigued by the idea of um, everybody taking more control over their kind of their financial future. And so um, specifically what's interesting right now is the everybody in the world is interested in investing, um, which to me is a really powerful thing um, where, you know, I, I'm seeing people openly talking about their decisions that they're making within public markets or private markets. And um, I think Robin had probably unlocked this new this new generation of everybody considering themselves to be investors. And I think that's really powerful because you obviously investing is risky and um, incredibly, incredibly challenging, but the more you can think about your own financial journey, um, I think the sooner you can have hopefully achieve financial independence and become actually do what you want to do in life. Um, I find a lot of people, get into kind of they're not able to pursue their passions because of financial reason, reasons and um, I really just want to invest in companies that help people pursue their passions and so um, the creator economy is a good part of that 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 theme is really interesting to me um, I worked mm -hmm. at school for a little bit um, which is empowering people to become more technical but um, I kind of just think that there's a lot of people in the world who just need opportunity and somebody to give them a chance. And um, I've always been attracted to businesses that kind of help people um, just pursue what they actually want to do in life. It's, it's a pretty simple thing, um, but it's, it's um, and I've one, one kind of eye opening part of this was I've probably worked with hundreds of, contractors all over the world who are often much better than my US peers at different things. And it's, I'm not saying that because, because of the audience here, it's, it's actually true. And um, I worked with a designer in Bulgaria five years ago who was amazing and she was in Bulgaria so she didn't have access to, to the US job market. And um, it's just kind of opened my eyes to this idea that the rest quote, unquote, the rest of the world should be given more opportunity too. Yep. And I think the pandemic has probably accelerated that access. Um, yeah. In I, it's what I love about crypto, actually, beyond um, everything else is that it's so, it's, it's so open in terms of uh, where you can build a company. Um, the types of founders I meet are just come from the craziest backgrounds. And um, I really love that. Yeah. Do you, do you see a lot of founders from India reaching out, Jeff? I do. Um, and I've, I've made a couple investments in India, but I definitely want to spend more time in the market and understand it better because um, it just, to me, feels like there's something um, within within SaaS, especially, I think I've seen happening where there's just been an explosion of, of new products that are being built in India that are really exciting. Yep, and that's of the global market and that's super exciting. Um, I know we're almost, I think, on time and what a fantastic conversation this has been. But before you go, I think we'll just do a quick rapid fire. Um, three books you've read that you would recommend to this room? Yeah, there's one I'm reading right now, which is great. It's called Super Founders and it kind of talks to this point of um, it looks at data from every unicorn um, of the past 25 years and tries to draw patterns and what makes a founder super. But um, a lot of the insights are very, were very revealing um, and kind of changed what I, they weren't what I expected. So that was um, 
interesting. What else? Oh, look at my bookshelf. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was probably the biggest one. If, if any more come to mind, I'll let you know. How about that? Awesome. I will follow <laughs> you on for those recommendations. <laughs> awesome. So let's go for it. Now, I was just saying we have a live Twitter thread going. So whenever you recall those three names, feel free to reply on that thread. Oh, I will add them. I do read a lot of books. Um, I read a lot more newsletters than books, unfortunately, now, which I think is probably the case for a lot of us. Where Are you unsubscribing uh, to newsletters from friends? Is that what led to the latest one between? <laughs> a lot of stuff. Oh, yeah. I, I joked yesterday that... Um, I'm subscribing to all my friends' newsletters and I can't unsubscribe because you're basically like uh, <laughs> telling them that that uh, you don't like their writing, but um, no, that was kind of a joke. Um, but yeah, a lot of sub stack and then just a lot of um, a lot of different things on, on the internet. I, I find actually the best, I'm in probably like a couple hundred Discord channels and so um, I find oh, wow. a lot of interesting ideas in Discord too. Amazing. Um, all right. Thank you so much for this, Jeff. This was such a fantastic conversation.